Hello and welcome. It's 10 a.m. on Thursday, the 29th of January. You're tuned in to our mid-morning newscast here on Arirang TV. Thanks for joining us. I'm Mark Broom. Let's take a look at what's making the headlines. Former South Korean President Im Yong bak says North Korea offered his administration an inter-Korean summit and an apology for the Chonan sinking in return for massive amounts of food aid. A U.S. research institute says North Korea may be attempting to restart its main nuclear bomb fuel reactor after a five-month shutdown. Plus, a purported Islamic State message demands a failed Iraqi suicide bomber be taken to the Turkish border by sunset Thursday, or the Jordanian pilot it is holding will be executed. The fate of the Japanese hostage is unclear. But we begin with that revelation by former President Im Yong bak The previous South Korean leader says that in mid-2010, North Korea offered to hold an inter-Korean summit and issue an apology over the deadly torpedo attack on a South Korean warship if Seoul gave it half a million tons of rice. Our uh, Hwang Jie has the details. Former South Korean President Lee myung bak has shed light on previously hidden history centering around issues like a proposed inter-Korean summit and an apology by North Korea for the Cheonan warship sinking. He says Pyongyang asked for 500,000 tons of rice in July 2010 in return for the highest level talks between the two Koreas and an apology for the attack on the warship. This came in an extract reported by Seoul-based Yeonam News Agency on Thursday, ahead of the official release of E's 800-page memoir on his presidency. The former president said he refused the offer because it would have been under Pyongyang's terms and he was not comfortable with it. He added the North's planned statement on the Cheonan warship sinking would have been a general apology, not an acceptance of its responsibility. He also said he strongly pressured then-Chinese President Hu Jintao during a G20 meeting in June 2010 to enforce international sanctions against Pyongyang after the deadly sinking. On his highly controversial river restoration project, he said future generations will be able to evaluate the true value of it. He cited other major government projects that faced criticism at the time but ended up being successful. The Four Rivers Project, a signature project of the former leader, has long been under fire over alleged shady construction deals and the irreversible damage it has done to local ecosystems. His book called President's Time is set to hit shelves next Monday. Huang Jie, Arirang News. Now to a development that, if true, could ratchet up tensions on the Korean peninsula. North Korea appears to be trying to restart its main nuclear bomb fuel reactor after a five-month shutdown. Satellite imagery posted on US-based website 38 North shows hot water draining from a pipe at the 5-megawatt Yongbyon reactor and snow melting on the roof of the reactor and turbine buildings in a signal perhaps that efforts to restart it are going on inside. The developments were observed over a two-week period from December 24th to January 11th. The U.S. Korea Institute at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies says it needs more time to monitor what's going on to conclude what exactly is happening at that nuclear site. Now, this reactor is believed to have the capability to produce enough plutonium to produce one nuclear bomb per year. The chief nuclear envoys of the United States and Japan have expressed their support for South Korea's efforts to improve inter-Korean relations. Following a trilateral meeting in Tokyo on Wednesday, South Korea's chief nuclear envoy, Hwang Jung-guk, said they agreed on the need for a strong signal from the North about its sincerity towards denuclearization in order to resume the stalled six-party nuclear talks. The multilateral dialogue involving the two Koreas, the U.S., China, Japan and Russia has been stalled since late 2008. 
South Korean and U.S. diplomats are meeting for talks in Seoul today, with the main focus being North Korea. The U.S. State Department's Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, Wendy Sherman, is uh, sitting down with South Korea's Vice Foreign Minister, Jo Tae-yong, this morning to discuss bilateral and inter-Korean issues such as uh, North Korea's refusal to answer the South's offer for high-level talks that was made a few weeks ago now. Washington's Under Secretary of State for Arms Control and International Security and Seoul's Deputy Minister for Multilateral and Global Affairs are also holding talks on North Korea's disarmament and non-proliferation issues. Now, inter-Korean relations might not have been the best in 2014, but trade between South and North Korea still reached a record high last year. Now, basically all the volume was shipped through a land route linked to the inter-Korean industrial complex in the north's border town of Kaesong. Uh, Song ji reports. Could this be a bright sign for the two Koreas' future relations? The Korea International Trade Association said on Wednesday inter-Korean trade volume topped $2.3 billion in 2014, more than double the figure from the year before. The cumulative trade volume over the past 26 years is $22 billion. Inter-Korean trade dropped to an eight-year low in 2013, the year Pyongyang shut down the jointly-run Kaesong Industrial Complex, citing heightened tensions on the peninsula. It resumed operations there five months later. The products from the complex account for almost all inter-Korean trade. The recent jump in trade volume could get an extra boost from a recently concluded free trade pact between Seoul and Beijing, as the two sides agree to acknowledge Kaesong products as being South Korean in origin. Manufacturers who invest in the Kaesong complex will gain a competitive edge as their labor costs will be lower than those in China. But obstacles to the stable growth of inter-Korean trade remain, with bilateral tensions a major concern. North Korea added a new clause in September last year that allows it to detain South Korean businessmen if they do not comply with a contract or fail to make agreed payments. Pyongyang held South Korean businessmen when it shut down the complex in April 2013, saying they had outstanding bills. Another challenge will be expanding the capacity of the factories within the complex. Seoul banned facilities investment in the joint complex after the sinking of Chunnan warship in 2010. Song ji Arirang News. Now, it's been confirmed that no Koreans were killed in the deadly attack on a luxury hotel in the Libyan capital Tripoli, which left at least nine people dead, including five foreigners. The Korean embassy in Tripoli told Yonap News on Thursday that the five foreign casualties were one U.S. citizen, one French national, and three people from Kyrgyzstan. There had earlier been reports that one Korean national had been killed. Militants loyal to Islamic State have claimed responsibility for this attack. An affiliate of IS released photos of two suicide bombers whom it said carried out this deadly attack. The two gunmen burst into the five-star hotel on Tuesday and set off a car bomb in a parking lot. Now, we're following news just coming in that a new audio recording has been released purportedly by the Islamic State group addressing the possibility of a prisoner exchange. We're going to connect straight away to Yunus Kim at the News Centre for more on this. So, Yunus, this is a very fluid story, but we understand that the recording had the voice of the Japanese hostage, Kenji Goto. You're right, Mark. The voice did identify itself as being the abducted Japanese war correspondent, and the new ultimatum gave specific instructions to release the Iraqi female fighter, Sajida al Rishawi. I'm Kenji Goto Jogo. This is a voice message I've been told to send to you. The voice goes on to say that the Jordanian pilot held hostage by IS, Muath al Kasasbe would be killed immediately unless al Rishawi, who's on Jordan's death row, is presented by sunset on Thursday, January 29th at the Turkish border. It is important to note here that the audio recording has yet to be verified. It was posted on YouTube early today. Jordan, of course, has said there will be no prisoner swap until the extremist group 
produces evidence that their pilot Al Kasasbe is safe and healthy. Amman has said it will it has yet to receive such an assurance. And earlier, State TV had reported a government spokesman had said it would be willing to trade the would-be suicide bomber for the young Jordanian. And Eunice, uh, that is a new offer that IS had not put on the table and Jordanian officials admit as such. So who is this, this man in the spotlight now? Well, Moaz al Kasasbe comes from a very prominent family in a high-ranking Jordanian tribe, important to the country's monarchy and the family, as well as supporters, have been uh, putting intense pressure on the government to do whatever it takes to bring the young man home. You'll remember he was captured in northern Syria in December when his F-16 fell from the sky. Hundreds of people had protested uh, in front of government buildings on Tuesday evening for his release and his father in fact recently said he was under the understanding that his son would fight within Jordan's borders and not in the bigger coalition fight against IS during which it is presumed that his F-16 had fallen from the sky. Yeah and Jordan of course has been a key Arab partner in that US led alliance against Islamic State and staying in uh, the Middle East. There's uh, new violence on the Lebanese border, this time between Hezbollah and Israeli troops, and it's left uh, three people dead. That's right. Two Israeli soldiers and one Spanish UN peacekeeper were killed when Hezbollah's uh, anti-tank missiles flew across the border and Israelis responded with fire. This in an area where the borders of Lebanon, Israel and Syria meet. The United Nations released a statement saying it condemned the death of the Spanish peacekeeper in the strongest terms while urging restraint. Earlier, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu had promised the attack attackers would pay the full price. Uh, Hezbollah said the strike was retaliation for an Israeli airstrike over the Syrian Golan Heights 10 days ago that had killed six of its fighters. And this latest attack, Mark, is raising the possibility of an escalation between Israel and Hezbollah after the two sides had engaged in a month-long war back in 2006. Well, I'm sure we're going to see a very strong reaction, as you normally do, from Israel in these kind of situations. Well, thank you very much, Eunice, and we'll see you back at noon. See you then. Korea Samsung Electronics has released its final figures for its fourth quarter earnings, which, sli which uh, slipped from the same period a year earlier. Samsung says its net profit dropped 27% from the same period in 2013 as smartphone sales slowed amid increased competition from its rivals in the global market. Net income for the quarter dropped to 4.9 billion US dollars. That's down from uh, 6.7 billion dollars the same period last year. In line with the earlier guidance, the figure confirms Samsung Electronics' first annual earnings decline in three years. For all of 2014, Samsung logged a net profit of $21.5 billion, down 23% from 2013. Better news for the world's second largest chipmaker, SK Hynix, which posted record high profits and sales for a second straight year in 2014. The Korean company's sales came to around 15 and a half billion US dollars last year. That's up more than 20% from a year earlier. Operating profits spiked by over 50% to 4.7 billion dollars. Net income was up 46% to 3.7 billion dollars, also an all-time high. Hynix attributes the rise to its cost-saving efforts amid a stable business environment with Samsung Electronics and Micron Technology as its only major rivals. Now, sales of iPhones hit a record high last quarter as Apple announced what is believed to be the biggest ever profit by a public company. In the final three months of 2014, Apple sold almost 75 million iPhones, boosted in large part by the latest generation of iPhone, the 6 and 6 Plus. Our Kim Jeon reports. 
Apple saw its revenue and profits soar during the holiday quarter thanks to record sales of its plus size iPhones. Apple sold 74.5 million iPhones during its first fiscal quarter of 2015 that ended December 27, 2014. Sales during the period drove the company's total revenue to 74.6 billion U.S. dollars, a 30 percent from a year earlier. The company's net profit went up to its highest level of $18 billion, reporting earnings of $3.06 a share. Released in September of last year, the iPhone 6 and 6 Plus models are the biggest iPhones yet, equipped with a 4.7-inch and 5.5-inch screen. That compares to the 4-inch screen on its previous iPhone 5 models. The jump in quarterly sales was also helped by sales of the iPhone in China. Market tracker Canalyst says Apple dominated the Chinese smartphone market during the October to December period last year. Apple recorded sales of around $16 billion in mainland China, Taiwan and Hong Kong during its fiscal 2015 first quarter. Apple is predicting its second quarter will be just as amazing as its first, with revenue of between $52 to $55 billion. This while other U.S. companies such as Microsoft have lowered their forecasts due to the strength of the dollar. The U.S. smartphone maker adds that it's releasing its next product, the Apple Watch, in April. Kim Jeong, Arirang News. Now, in this day and age, it's hard to argue with the importance of teaching children how to program computer software. The Korean government has recognized this need and is expanding its plans to teach elementary school kids the basics. This plan is pretty ambitious, but is the framework in place for it to be a success? Our Shin Semin reports. Developing your own computer software would be a daunting task for the uninitiated, but it's a key skill to know in this increasing technological age. Kids in Korean schools are learning the basics of software design using this program called Scratch. I used to think designing and developing software was difficult, but I realized that it can be quite easy using programs such as this. By matching up some programming codes and hooking up the light sensors to the system, children can even create their own computer game. Learning the concept of software allows them to understand the computer games they play. I also see them introducing software programs to their younger brothers and sisters. It's a great way of learning and owning the skills they've acquired. Software education is being rolled out across more schools in Korea. The science ministry is aiming to up the number of elementary and middle schools teaching software from 72 to more than 230 this year. The ministry also plans to hold more than 10 creative software camps in 2015. Teaching software development is a great way of stimulating young minds and getting them interested in programming. The ideas are grand, but putting them into practice could prove trickier. Many schools in Korea still lack enough computer labs, PCs and teachers sufficiently trained in programming. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Now, people with autism have a very difficult time in society as they lack certain social and communication skills. But local researchers here in Korea may have found the key to developing a new treatment for this disorder by pinpointing the main cause. Uh, Song Jung-in has more. This child has been diagnosed with autism. His mother rattles a toy to try and engage with him, but he does not react and continues to play by himself. He seems to be in his own world with little need for social interaction. Until now, the treatment for autism was limited to physical therapy to reduce the repetitive behavior associated with the disorder. But recently, a group of local researchers identified a protein called IRSP53 that could be the main cause of the social impairment in people with disorders such as autism or schizophrenia. Here, in this experiment, one mouse approaches another mouse without hesitating. The mouse without the protein shows no interest in the other one and carries on with its own activity. The researchers found that something called an excitatory NMDA receptor is overactive in mice that don't have the protein, causing social and communication impairments. Scientists hope the discovery will lead to an effective treatment for similar disorders. It is important for the NMDA receptor to function normally, because it is when this receptor is functioning at a level that's too low or too high that problems arise. Knowing the receptor's status could help doctors prescribe the right medication. 
The results of the study were featured in the renowned scientific journal Nature Neuroscience. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. And a good Thursday morning to you all as we kick things off with the ongoing scandal over Park Tae-hwan and his testosterone shot, or I should say shots, as in multiple injections. That's right, more reports coming out on Tuesday afternoon as the Olympic swimmer allegedly visited an anti-aging clinic to receive the Navito shots, which is a renowned testosterone injection. But it wasn't just once, as reports indicate that it was at least 10 times that he visited the clinic without ever telling his management team. Now, all signs point to a possible ban from the sport for at least four years as he's set to face a hearing with FINA on February 27th in Lausanne, Switzerland. The 2014 LPGA season was quite an exciting season, especially for all the Korean golfers in the tour. But with the 2015 season teeing off today, it's even more excitement as the season kicks off with the 2015 LPGA Coats Championship. With Park Hyung-bee starting off the new season, still as the top-ranked golfer, expectations remain high as they hope to see her accomplish a career grand slam this season. But the media has their eyes on teenage sensation Lydia Ko, who many expect to take over Park's spot at the top of the ranking. And as for rookie Chang Ana, she's off to a great start, currently tied for first at five under par after the first round. Now, for the longest time, Chaduri, a.k.a. Chaminator, was considered one of the most entertaining footballer in Korea. But, fortunately, he's one match away from retiring from the national team. But that is unless the fans can do something about it. Now, thanks to the clean-shaven defender's incredible contribution to the Asian Cup team this month, fans do not want to see him say goodbye as a petition titled, We Still Need You, Chaduri, was started. So far, there's been over 1,200 signatures of fans who want to see him continue playing for the national team after the big match on Saturday. But despite all that, the Chaminator has made it clear that he will keep his word and hopefully retire with Korea's first Asian Cup title in 55 years. Now, next in Heroes lost a big bat in Kang Jong Ho after he signed with the Pittsburgh Pirates earlier this month, but they did get a nice $5,2015 check. It seems like they might lose another big bad, this time in Park Byung-ho. According to a report that surfaced on Tuesday, the two-time KBO MVP has signed with Octagon, the same sports management company that represents Kang Jong-ho. The 29-year-old slugger, who has expressed his desire to go over to the majors, will be eligible to be posted after November 1st, as a number of Major League scouts are expected to visit his games this season. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs. day for southern provinces. As we can see, rain clouds are dropping rain to Jeju Island and Jeollado provinces at the moment, which should turn to snow in any minute. So Jeollado and Gyeongsangdo provinces could see up to 8 centimeters of heavy snow fall, while other regions could see 1 to 5 centimeters of accumulation. In the meantime, mostly cloudy day is in store for Seoul and its surrounding area. So even if the daytime high will be slightly higher today, it should feel as cold or chillier than yesterday due to that lots of clouds. And with that in mind, let's take a closer look at the readings for other parts of the nation. The high in Daegu and Gwangju will rise to 6 and 4, and Busan 
sun will peak at 7 this afternoon. And as for the other regions, Jeju Island and Daejeon will see a high of 8 and 4, and Dokdo tops out at 3. And it seems like we'll wrap up the January under a quite cold conditions with a freezing morning low expected on Saturday morning with a low of minus 7 here in Seoul. That's all for the weather. Have a wonderful day. Thank you very much, Gion, for the weather. And that's all we have for now. Plenty more stories online, and it's also worth checking out our smartphone app for the latest news and other Arirang programs. We'll be back at noon Korea time with our next newscast. Until then, goodbye.